Welcome back to Say You Really Want to Learn Latin. And today we are going to continue the story of the early history of Rome. And we're just going to run through what happened when Rome was ruled by kings. Now, you will remember, of course, that the first king of Rome was Romulus. And Romulus ruled apparently from 753 BC until 715 BC. And in 715 BC, dear old Romulus went up to meet his maker. Or rather, what is supposed to have happened is one day while walking through the Campus Martius, he was enveloped in a cloud and taken up to heaven. When the cloud disappeared, there was no sign of Romulus. And the Romans thought that he had been turned into a god, and they worshipped him thereafter under the name of Quirinus. Now this was a thing that Romans used to do quite often. They would, if there was a person that they particularly venerated, uh, they would believe them to be a god after their death. Um, the Emperor Augustus, for example, was worshipped as Divus Augustus, the divine Augustus. Uh, Julius Caesar was thought to be a god, all sorts of Roman emperors. In fact, most Roman emperors after their death were worshipped as gods. Peculiar but true. Now, after Romulus came the king Numa Pompilius, who reigned from 715 BC to 673 BC. Notice how these dates are going backwards because they are BC dates. Now, Numa is most famous for having built the Temple of Janus. And uh, the Temple of Janus was famous in Rome because the doors of the temple were left open during times of war and closed during times of peace. It is, of course, a, a sign of how warlike the Romans were that the temple gates were very, very rarely closed. Numa is also famous for having had an affair with um, a lady called Egeria. Egeria was a fortune-telling nymph, and the king used to walk with her in the gardens and seek her advice. After Numa, we get Tullus Hostilius. Now, Tullus Hostilius ruled from 673 to 642 BC. As you can probably guess by his name, he was a very warlike king and spent a huge amount of his time beating up the local tribes, in particular the Albani, who came from Alba Longa. After Tullus, we get Ancus Martius. Now, Ancus Martius ruled from 642 to 617 BC. He is famous for having extended uh, Roman control all the way from the city down to the coast and is credited with having built or laid the foundations for the Roman port of Ostia. Almost certainly he had nothing to do with that, but it's nice to attribute it to someone. Now, after the death of Ancus, the throne passed not to his two sons, or to one of his two sons, as might have been expected, but to an Etruscan called Tarquinius Priscus. Tarquinius Priscus ruled until 579 BC. But it was during his reign that a rather peculiar thing happened. Now, living in the palace with the king was a slave boy whose name was Tullius. One day, Tullius was sleeping in the palace and those around him noticed that there were flames coming out of his head. The boy himself was completely unharmed, but flames definitely coming out of his head. Now this was taken to be a great omen and everyone got very excited. The king had the boy betrothed to his daughter and everyone thought he was going to be the next king. Well, everyone was very pleased about this, apart from the two sons of Ancus, who of course were absolutely furious. 
And one day they rushed into the palace and murdered Tarquinius Priscus. And they then resolved to seize the throne for themselves. But the slave boy was very unimpressed by this and he drove the two sons of Ancus out of the palace and they were never seen again. The slave boy Tullius was then crowned as king and because of his servile origins, he was called Servius Tullius. And Servius Tullius ruled Rome from 578 BC to 535 BC. Now, you, you might wonder where these dates are coming from. Well, the honest truth is they're coming from the Oxford Classical Dictionary and they are said to be traditional. Now, what that really means is no one has got the first idea when these things happened, but they've allocated a date and those dates have gone down in the Classical Dictionary and are said to be the ones we should learn. So, traditional dates, very useful. Now, Servius Tullius... Uh, the new king of Rome, then began taking steps to cement his position. He realised he was in a slightly precarious position because he was a mere slave, or had been a mere slave. So the first thing he did was he married off his two daughters to the sons of the murdered king, Tarquinius Priscus. Now at this stage it becomes a little bit confusing because everyone seems to have the same name or a very similar name. So we'll take this slowly. One of Servius Tullius's daughters, whose name was Tullia, now there's a bit of a trick there really, Tullia is just the feminine version of Tullius and daughters very often took a name which was linked to their father. One of the daughters, Tullia, who was a very ambitious and rather hot-headed young girl, was married off to the very gentle son of Tarquinius Priscus, whose name was Arons Tarquinius. He was a gentle, mild boy. Her sister, however, also called Tullia, was herself a very mild and gentle girl, but she was married off to the hot-headed, ambitious son of Tarquinius Priscus, whose name was Lucius Tarquinius. Lucius, we say in English, but he would have pronounced his name Lucius. So Lucius Tarquinius, very hot-headed son, married to Tullia, the very mild and gentle daughter of the current king. And Lucius's mild brother, Arons Tarquinius, has now been married off to the very hot-headed daughter of the previous king, Tullia. So we've got two Tullias, one hot-headed, one mild, married to two sons, one hot-headed, one mild. Now, you can see what's going to happen here. These two marriages were not marriages made in heaven. The wrong boy had married the wrong girl, and the wrong girl had married the wrong boy. And as you might expect, what happened was there was a bit of wife swapping that went on. And the hot-headed Lucius Tarquinius got together with the hot-headed, ambitious Tullia. And between them, they resolved to seize the throne for themselves. Now, Lucius Tarquinius got a little bit above himself, and one day he was strutting around the centre of Rome and saw the king's chair and he thought right well that's a good place for me and he went and sat in the king's chair. Now Servius Tullius was not very pleased when he came into the senate house and there in the chair that should have been his own in the king's chair he saw his son-in-law Lucius Tarquinius sitting proudly and so the king grabbed the young boy and dragged him out of the chair. Well, Lucius Tarquinius was having none of that, so he grabbed his father-in-law and pushed him roughly down the steps of the Senate House. The king 
bruised and battered, made his way slowly back home through the streets of Rome. But on the way, the supporters of Lucius Tarquinius grabbed the king and murdered him. By this stage, Tullia, the obnoxious, ambitious, hot-headed one, had actually got rid of her sister and had married Lucius Tarquinius. Aaron's Tarquinius also had been disposed of. So we've just got the two hot-headed ones and they are now married. And Tullia parades through the streets of Rome in her carriage, uh, hailing her husband, Lucius Tarquinius, as king of Rome. And as she drives through the streets, she sees the body of her murdered father lying in the street. But far from stopping to mourn him, oh no, she orders the driver of her carriage to drive over the body. And that is not the way to treat your father, dead or alive. That place in Rome can be seen to this day and it is known as the Street of Crime. Tullia was splattered with the blood of her father, but she didn't seem to care. Now Lucius Tarquinius went on to be uh, king of Rome and he ruled until 510 BC. He was very keen to cement his power. He didn't allow his father-in-law to be buried. He got rid of a load of the aristocracy who might have been expected to support the murdered king and that way cemented his own power base in the city. He was a good general and he conquered many of the neighbouring tribes around Rome, but he was proud and overbearing and he soon uh, picked up the nickname of Tarquinius Superbus, Tarquin the Proud. Now the final straw came when the son of Tarquinius Superbus, who, as you would expect, was himself a hot-headed, ruthless young man, raped a Roman lady whose name was Lucretia. Now, Lucretia's husband was away fighting with the Roman army, and uh, Lucretia, horrified by what had happened and by the loss of her virtue and her honour, sent for her husband to come back to hear what had happened, and sent for the rest of her family. And as they arrived to hear the terrible thing that had happened, she took out a knife and stabbed herself, claiming that she could not live with the dishonour of having been raped by this wretched son of Tarquin the Proud. As she was dying, she begged her family to seek revenge. Well... This really was the final straw for the House of Tarquin. Tarquinius Superbus, already unpopular, was now driven from the city. And he was driven by a band of uh, honourable Romans led by a man called Brutus. Now Brutus, we will, <laughs> we will hear that name later in our history. But this Brutus, Lucius Junius Brutus, was the head of what became a very noble family. He got rid of Tarquin the Proud, drove him out of the city, and the Romans then resolved that they could not abide living under a monarchy for a day longer. The kings had become ambitious and unruly and tyrannical, and so the Romans devised a new system of government. And from that day, in 510 BC, the Romans were ruled by two consuls. Now, a consul was a little bit like a prime minister in, in modern political speak, but there were two of them, and they ruled for one year only. Okay? They had two so that neither one could become too powerful, and they ruled for one year only so that they wouldn't have time to generate too much tyrannical power for themselves. This ushered in 
the period of Roman history which we call the Republic. So we've had the kings, the kings have been driven out, we don't want them anymore, and now we enter the golden years of Rome's history when she was a Republic. The consuls were elected each year by members of the Senate, and the Senate was like a form of Parliament. You had to be a patrician to be a member of the Senate, now that involved a certain property qualification, uh, so perhaps a little bit more like the House of Lords than the House of Commons in, in the UK. But nonetheless, this body, the Senate, elected the consuls, and the consuls were answerable to the Senate. And for many, many hundreds of years, Rome flourished under this form of government. And just to connect back to our friend Brutus, it was many hundreds of years later, 44 BC to be precise, that a member of the Senate, Julius Caesar, was accused of trying to grab more power than was appropriate for this form of government. He was accused of having um, tried to set himself up as a king. And his friend, Brutus, was, was not happy with this, and so resolved to challenge Julius Caesar over this. And we have the famous scene in the Roman Forum where a band of conspirators circle Julius Caesar, draw their swords, and stab him because they think that's the only way to get rid of him as a tyrant. And as the knives are going in, Julius Caesar is fending them off, and then he looks and he sees his friend Brutus and famously says, et tu, Brute, even you, Brutus, and you, Brutus. And that's rather interesting because in a recent lesson we did on questions in Latin, we learned there were three ways of doing them. One using a questioning word, one putting ne on the end of the first word, and one introducing the question with a word such as none or num. And in that famous line, et tu brute, none of the above are used, it's just the tone of voice. Anyway, that's enough about the kings of Rome for now. Uh, we will carry on with this exciting run through Roman history in due course. But see you back here for more videos very soon, and hope it's all going well.